got the invitation, I was just thinking about what I wanted to talk about um, and present to you all. So this, this question came up and it was like, what is the role of a good cook? What's the role of a good cook? And I thought about it and I was thinking, you know, there are many things, but have you ever, you know, but a good cook makes you feel something. Have you ever had a meal before and you just bite into it, right? And it just, and, and like you just begin to think about your grandmama in the kitchen just cooking, just cooking away. Or maybe, brothers, if you ate something before and you're like, she made this for me? She, I gotta put a ring on it. Just something, right? Food should make you feel something. And I think that we spend so much time about that particular moment, right? The in meal experience, how people are feel. But do we ever think about how they feel after the meal? Do we ever think about what happens after they leave the dinner table? How much time do we spend thinking about that? Do we ever think about the health issues associated with the food that we prepare? Not a lot of time. And in my own experience, that's something that I had to confront. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think that we're responsible for if someone has diabetes and they sit down at your table and they eat that whole cake, that's on them. They gotta have some common sense. However, I do think that we can all agree that we can all be just a little bit more educated about the food that we prepare, how we prepare it, and its effect on our bodies. Can we agree to that? Yeah. All right, so with that, oh, we gotta, oh, yeah, we do have a presentation. Let's keep going. Next slide. So I, so I like to do slides because I want people to walk away with something because today is not just about the recipe, it's about giving you all ideas. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so I want to introduce this concept of calorie conscious cooking, all right? Now, I don't like the word healthy because the reality is healthy is really relative, right? Healthy, can, and people think of healthy, they think of lettuce, chicken breast, and salads and ain't nobody got time for that. And I personally don't believe that God will put us on this earth, have all these amazing cultures, this wonderful food, and give us jollof rice and say like you can't eat it. The devil is a lie. So, calorie conscious cooking is just being aware of how the food we put into our bodies, how it makes us feel, and how it contributes to our overall wellness and well-being. It's just that. So I'm not saying that you gotta give up the foods that you love. I'm just saying that you need to be a lot more conscious of how that food is making you feel in your overall wellness. Next slide. So let me give you three tenets of calorie conscious cooking that I've come up with that help to guide me in my own lifestyle because I think that healthy living should not be starvation. It's, it's very practical. Healthy living is very colorful, it's vibrant, it's flavorful. So the first thing that you got to do when you're in calorie conscious cooking is to understand the ingredients and their benefits. It's the first thing. We're talking about if you're going to eat that sweet potato, go back, go back. If you're going to eat that sweet potato, then you got to want to know like how many carbs that is. Is this a simple carb or a complex carb? It's just to understand the ingredients, right? Going past, just putting stuff onto a plate, you want to understand it. The second tenet is to don't rely solely on oils and fats to give you flavor. That there are tons of vegetables and fruits that you can use and infuse inside of your um, uh, meals in order to give it flavor. The third thing is to employ different methods. We can't always, just because we saw grandma do it, we don't need to keep on frying stuff. We can look at baking and roasting and grilling. You gotta get different methods too and different tools so you can get a nonstick skillet that will allow you to use much less oil you can also do stuff like cooking on lower heats, all right? So this stuff is just, a, these are just practical things that we can all begin to do so we can live healthier and happier, all right? I say all right? Yeah. All right, let's move on. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna substitute out the actual rice in the recipe and we're gonna use a vegetable and that vegetable is cauliflower. Did you know that you can cut out over half, more than half of the heavy carbohydrate um, calories just by substituting in a vegetable. Now the vegetable is gonna come out to look like this. So we're gonna walk through that right now. All right, so when you buy it, it looks a little bit like this, right? So the first thing we're gonna do, and help me out, we're gonna chop off the stems. Chop off the stems right there. Okay, good. 
right? And don't throw this away. Now, a lot of people throw away the stems, but I'm gonna show y'all, this is a no-waste recipe, meaning that you can use every part of this recipe in something else. It's always gonna serve a purpose. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Kev, Kevin? We already we, got questions. Are, are we still using the slides? Oh, no, I'm sorry, you can yeah, cut so the can slides. Yeah, so can we have the camera just zoom in on what you're doing? Yeah? No, no, cut the slides, cut the slides. Can we have the camera zoom in on what, what he's doing? Right, so people can just okay. see from all Chef, over the come place. come on over here. Because this part is really important. So let's give the stems over here to Chef James. Put those onto the baking sheet for me, and I'm going to be over there in one second. So what we're going to do... Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take off the stems, and we're going to be left with just the cauliflower florets, just like this. So when you do it, and you can actually buy it in the grocery store like this, but it'll save you some money if you just do it yourself. And once you got the florets, you're gonna put them into this food processor. Now, that's one way to do it. Okay, that's enough, we can just show this in part. Let's pop the top. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna pulse blend. This is going to, huh? yep, go ahead. I think it's good. Perfect. You're gonna pulse blend it. Don't, don't pulverize it because it's gonna to become too fine. But what you'll find is the consistency is much like couscous or rice. So depending on, where's the cameraman? Right here, can you see my hands right here? Don't laugh at my fingernails, I've been cooking and stuff, all right, so there you go. You can see the consistency is a little bit like couscous and some pieces are like rice but you want them coarse, just like this. And I don't think that you can see this, but cauliflower, and we forget that vegetables are made of water, all right? So the first thing we have to do, once we make the cauliflower like this, take, and squeeze it out, is you're gonna dump it onto a sheet and squeeze it out. Squeeze out all of that moisture. And the cool thing about uh, you know, this is that there are so many different applications for cauliflower in this way. You can pulverize it even more, and you can mix it in with a little bit of coconut flour and then some Parmesan cheese, and you can make a crust with it to bake stuff on. In this capacity, we're just going to use it as rice. Now, once we do that, you're going to want to spread it out onto a baking sheet so that it kind of airs out like a little bit. Now this is fine as is. This is ready to go. You can put this into recipes and you can cook with it. Or let's say that you're having just a really like lazy day and you don't want to do too much but you want to keep it light on the carbs. Take this, saute it with a little bit of garlic and onions into a pan and you've got some flavored rice. But it's all vegetable. So as she's doing that, I'm going to show you all what we can do with these stems. This is a no-waste recipe. So that means that you can take these stems and this could be a meal too. So we're, so we're all about using everything and also incorporating a lot more veggies. Now, I asked you before, what is the common spice combination that people use here? Uh, if we use um, onions, garlic, and pepper. Onions, garlic, and pepper. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna add some. Okay, it's good. Okay, so. He's already mixed together onions, garlic, and pepper. Yeah. We're gonna massage it with just a little bit of olive oil, just, just a tad bit. Okay. Get some salt. Perfect. You don't need pepper on there? We'll get some, a little bit of pepper as well. Okay. okay, I'll do that right. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you. Okay. And we're gonna roast this in the oven right now for 15 minutes at 400, 15 minutes at 200 um, Celsius. And this, oh, you put that in there. And this right so, and this right there is a meal like by itself. This has nothing to do with the jambalaya, but I want you all to know that you should not be just throwing away vegetables. You can always recycle them and use them in different ways. Chef Laura reminded me, there's another way that you can do this. So if you don't have access to a, a food processor, and also like you didn't get to the gym and you want to burn some extra calories, what you do is you get a grater and do this. And you can grate the cauliflower. This gives it a much more finer appearance and a much more like couscous. 
but you can do that too in case you don't have a food processor. Thanks for reminding me of that. All right, so with that part being done, we're gonna start this jambalaya. Let's fire up the skillet. Oh, and, and are there questions now or do you wanna just keep on going? Okay. Oh. If I'm waiting on you, so if oh, you okay. want, we can, we can shoot. I, we can start I can with do questions. freestyle, I can keep on going, so okay. we can, sorry. Well, listen up, um, Kevin already started. So if you have any questions, just raise, indicate by okay. raising your hands and I'll come Perfect. to you and pass hot? the mic. So okay. we already got the first one. Okay, could you tell us your name and then just give us your question? Okay. Hello everyone. Hi, Chef Kevin. Hi. Thank you for hosting us today. My question is with the cauliflower. Okay. It's been squeezed out now. Are we baking it? And at what temperature? No. No. Just We're like going to use this. Thank you. That's a great question. So you don't want to bake the cauliflower rice. You can. Um, the cauliflower, because you want the consistency to be, to be kind of crunchy and somewhat rice-like. Now you can take this and you can put it inside soups once the soup is nearly finished cooking. So that way it's not like mush. So when people are eating the soup, it's kind of like rice, right? Now, whenever you want to substitute the rice for this, you're probably going to want to use about three or four of the cauliflower rice because it's really fine. Plus, this is still filling, but it's not going to be filling like rice, okay? So don't bake this, just keep it as is. If anything, if you want to cook it, then you can put it into a pan with a little bit of oil and some onions and garlic and make yourself some flavored rice. And so that's why, you know, just do that like that. Okay, Right. so I think the pan's hot. I'm gonna keep going right here. If you get another question, it's fine. We got another okay. one, hold on a okay. second. Is, this, is it hot now? Okay. Ha Hello, my name is Ola. I've been hey. following you on Instagram for a long time. I oh, was so excited when I found out you were coming. Okay. Um, so some. the question I wanted to ask, when you're making uh, sauces, and you want to thicken it, but you don't want to make it unhealthy by using corn flour, what is your favorite um, thing to add to it? Okay, or substitute, it's, it's, rather. it's a great question. So, we, um, to thicken sauces, so it, it really depends. If it is a creamy sauce, I like to use coconut milk, I mean, coconut cream. So if you have, do you have cans of coconut milk and stuff like that in the yeah, fridge? So just, yeah. um, you know, so just, open it up and let the coconut sit there for about 20 minutes and let all of the cream rise to the top and then use that. Um, if you're having something that's a little bit less like creamy and it's more like a gravy type of sauce, I like to use tapioca flour or arrowroot flour. <coughs> yeah. okay. All right, so I think this is ready. What we're gonna do is we are going to add a little bit of oil to the skillet. Now, it's really important for these recipes for healthier cooking, again, to use a nonstick skillet. Nonstick skillets require, allow you to cook. Um, Chef, Chef James? One second. The minced garlic. Minced garlic. Nonstick skillets allow you to cook at, at um, cook without using a whole lot of oil. So that way you don't have to add that. And if you're trying to reduce the amount of calories in your diet, it's really important. This is not a nonstick skillet, so you may see a little bit more oil here. And if you notice, whenever you cook, you'll have to keep on adding oil so the food doesn't stick. A nonstick skillet doesn't work like that. So there are different types out there. There's black kind, and then there is now the new like ceramic kind. But I highly um, suggest that you all invest in that. Okay, so this is, that's about good. Let's chop up some more. Okay. All right. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna saute a little bit of garlic and onion together. Now, when people do this, people tend to keep the skillet so hot that the garlic gets all brown and it burns. The most important thing that you wanna do is we're trying to flavor the oil, which is important because we only have this much oil in this recipe, so we don't wanna waste it all, right? So we're just trying to flavor it. That's good, that's good, that's good. Okay, let's add that into this skillet. And we're also gonna add a little bit of onion. Again, this process here is just to flavor the oil. We're going to reduce the heat just a little bit, and we're going to keep cooking this until the onions turn brown and translucent, and all the oil is flavored with the garlic. Again, we want to be careful not to burn the garlic. Let's move on to the protein. Chef James, you want to help me out with that? So we're going to keep on stirring this. We're going to monitor this. I'm going to put this on low heat. And you want to cook this for That was planned. Yo, Simi. Simi. Okay, so that was planned. Are you good? Yeah, I'm good, I'm good. 
um, not only are my ears small, but I also like sweat like crazy just, just because. So it just kind of falls off me. All right, so we're gonna cook this for about two to three minutes and just make sure that the garlic is not burned and we're gonna season the oil here. Now, next thing we're gonna do is, is get ready for the protein. Can you see that? And again, you want this on low heat. All right, let's get the protein ready. Do our vegetables. So, again, one of the things that I really love about calorie conscious cooking is being able to rely on vegetables. Now, I've seen the bell pepper in many recipes here, but sometimes with all the gravy and stuff, it kind of just is, looks like a, you know, like a noodle. You really can't taste it. So you really want to rely on things like this to flavor your dishes. So you don't want to overcook them. First thing we're going to do is we're going to dice it up. Now, I was talking to her over at the academy, and I showed her a way that I like to dice up my bell pepper, and I want her to show you all that today. So it's, it's a really easy way. You're going to chop off the bottom of it. We can get the cameraman up here to, to get this. Chop off the top of it. And you're going to make a really small cut on the side. Great. And then run your knife around the inside of it. And use a smaller knife if you ever you have one. So that it comes right out just like this. So now whenever you dice it, let's do the slices. Okay. So whenever you slice it, it's much more uniform and a lot and a lot easier to do. Now we're gonna use this but we're also gonna have a little bit of celery. Celery is in the original recipe too, but what I like about celery is it's very hydrating and it's got some crunch to it and it does pack some flavor. Now, this is my own addition with some cherry tomatoes. I wanted the dish to, to kind of balance out some of the smoky, savory flavors, so instead of adding sugar, you can look to cherry tomatoes. You can also use cherry tomatoes in your smoothies. You know, these all um, get really creamy whenever you blend them up. So instead, of, so if you're trying to make something just a tad bit creamy, turn the heat down just a little bit. Then cherry tomatoes would be a great addition to that. So I think this chicken is about done. Add in a little bit more sausage, and Chef, then we're going to now Chef. add in some diced bell pepper. Chef, I have a question for you real quick, please. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So there's a lady who's asking, because you mentioned earlier that you you don't like to waste ingredients, right? Mm -hmm. So she asked. The water that was squeezed out of the cauliflower, is, <laughs> is it edible? Where is she? Use it? Where is she asked that question? Where is over she? There. I want you to stand up and come over here right now, and I want you to taste this uh, cauliflower water. Come over here and taste it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. She's like, no, and you don't want to taste that. Um, that's <laughs> she got me, but that's uh, that's the one thing that I do kind of toss out. It's not that it's not that great. So with the chicken done on the outside we're going to add in some bell pepper for some crunch a little bit of celery as well we're going to add in some sweetness with the cherry tomatoes again this is my addition because i don't want to add in some sugar mm -hmm. and then where is our sauce Let's get here Let me get. so if you cannot if you can't find tomato sauce and we made this then you can just make your own now how i do it is just roasting them in the oven for maybe like 15, 20 minutes until they're really soft. Put them into a blender and liquefy it. Now you can take some time and you can strain it, but I like to have a little bit of crunchiness, oh not crunchiness, but some texture to my tomato sauce. So this is just like this. Now Chef James, because he's a hero, he went and he smoked this for about an hour and a half. So this is smoky tomato sauce. So this stuff is hitting. So we're gonna add a little bit of tomato sauce in there as well right now. This is going to boost the smoky flavor. And you can do stuff like that, too, if you can't get the smoked sausage. Thank you very much, Mara. We're going to add a little bit more of the bell pepper that she added in there. Chef, could you just, yep. I mean, how, how do you smoke tomato sauce? I mean, tomato sauce. How do, how do you do that? Just, you just... So we smoke the tomatoes. So okay, you don't how do you smoke the tomatoes? tomatoes? Okay, so you put them onto a tray, and you put them into a smoker. Um, Chef James, do you want to talk about how you did it here? Because he did it there at the culinary school, I have a smoker and grill at home. So what I would do is I would turn on the grill and get the smoke going at a very low temperature and put him in there for about 45 minutes. I think his way was a little bit different. What'd you do? Yeah, as, as good as the same. But uh, all, all we do here is local smoker. We use firewood and uh, let the smoke uh, uh, while we dismantle. We put use oil, then the smoke will so you can be able to grill it. So, so, so let me just let me just ask. Yeah. So, what what does the smoke do? Does it dehydrate the 
The tomato? No, or no, no. What, what does it do? No, it flavors it. Oh, just flavors so it. So right? we're getting the flavor from the wood. So right. we got like a, I'm not sure what type of wood, but we're going to say hickory because it sounds fancy. This is hickory smoked tomato sauce. Right. Hickory smoked beef. Right. But it helps to flavor the meal. Okay, now we're going to give this meal some personality. And Patricia, can you help me out by taking some of the stuff we're not using? So the first thing we're going to add in there is some smoked paprika. Now, if you can't find paprika here, you can just use regular paprika. But what I like about it is that it gives it a nice southwest flavor. So it's one of the things. Now, we're going to add in a little bit of heat by adding in some cayenne, some cayenne pepper. Um, you do this according to your own desires. <clears throat> uh, chef, we got another question. Num absolutely. Let me get to the seasonings, and I'm going to get right to you. We're going to add in some dried thyme. And I like adding in some of the dried um, seasonings to these recipes instead of the, um, the fresh ones because I think that they are um, much more flavorful. W where's the oregano? And there is some oregano that we should, all right, can we get some oregano up here? All right. That's pepper. Oh, okay. Go ahead with your question while we get the dried oregano here. Hello, chef. Hi. Hi, my name is Joy. What's up, Joy? And I'm an aspiring chef too. And the question I want to ask is, after he cut the chicken in pieces, do you need to marinate it separately before adding it to the oil, or you just do it directly? Because I didn't get that part, yes. No, 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 P cook the chicken um, together. So this is a one skillet recipe. That's why I like it. You don't have to do a whole bunch. Just have this one skillet here the entire time. Okay? Thank you. Um, is it time coming? Let's get that. Now we got some dry time. We have another, hey, another question, Chef. Patricia Jeff. with the handoff, appreciate it. So we got some dried oregano here. Will you give me some more tomato sauce? Some more tomato sauce? Yes. No, tomato behind him. Okay. And then we're gonna stir we're gonna stir this up and get this going. Now we're gonna reduce the heat because we don't want this to you know to um, to overcook. Just a little bit, just a little bit of that. Okay. So this has been dried out, and what she did after she squeezed it out was she spread it out to make sure that there were no really big chunks in it, and also just so that they can breathe some, because again, you don't want a lot of that water and moisture into the recipe. So we're gonna add that to the um, dish. Remember, this is going to be our rice. Yeah, just put it all in there, it's okay. Um, this is our couscous. And then, we're gonna grab some chicken stock, once this is all added in there. That's good. Yeah? Thank you. Perfect. So we're gonna give this a good stir. And I'm not sure if the cameraman can see this, but it looks a lot like rice, doesn't it? If you can see. Oh, I've, I've got this part. Okay. Get some, give me a thing for that tomato paste. Yeah. And now we're going to add in a little bit of the chicken stock. Let's get some chicken stock first. So we're going to add in about a cup of the chicken stock. And we're going to bring everything to a simmer. All right. Now, depending on how, uh, how you like it, if you like yours a little bit more loose, then you're not going to add in as much tomato paste. But if you eat over there, over at the yellow chili, then you know that theirs is pretty thick. So we're going to add in some really thick scoops of tomato paste. Make it technically. Y'all saw them over here making it. OK, now, here's how I do my plate. I want everyone to stop what they're doing and look at these two slides. This is, how, this is what your plate should look like. Now, I'm not saying nothing, because I've been to yellow chili, and I've also been to La Freak. The food was good, but the plate didn't look like this. So when you are making your dinner plate, the first thing is that I want us to stop using platters for plates. We, our plate should be this big, just right here, just like that. The second thing is that I want half of the plate with veggies. They can be raw or they can be cooked. Now, now, now when I say cooked, like my mom one time, she was trying to lose some weight. She's like, oh, yeah, I had some steamed broccoli. And I was like, oh, okay, good, mama. Yeah, dad just put some cheese on top of it. And I said, wait, what? Yeah, he just melted up some cheddar cheese and put it on top. And I'm like, that's defeating the purpose. <laughs> All right, so you half your plate should be veggies. 30% of your plate should be a lean protein. So again, we're talking about chicken, some turkey, chicken breast, turkey. We can, and maybe, lamb is not lean, but if you cut off some of the fat, you can do that. And then 20% carbs. Now when I say carbs, Again, the veggies, that's not potato, all right? These are greens, and these are things that, you know, they're non-starchy veggies.
Carbs are things like rice, quinoa, potatoes, things like that. Um, chef, Where are so you? two things. I have, yeah. I have a couple questions, but I must just say something. Listen, we're running out of time, so we may not be able to entertain that many questions. Hold on a second, please. Uh, secondly, um, here's a few for you. First off is, in your cooking, what do you focus on the most? Is it the taste and its flavor or its nutritional benefits and value? Perfect. Um, to be quite honest, I, I look at the taste now. Before, I was looking at the nutritional benefits. Here's how I got started, and maybe you all can do this too. Take your favorite meal that you just really love, your favorite comfort food meal, and I want you to break down every ingredient and find out how you can make each ingredient healthier. Not everything is going to have a substitute. Veggies are veggies. But look at the rice. What type of rice can I use? What type of carb can I use? What type of protein can I use to make it healthier? That's how I did. My first healthy meal was a quesadilla. And a quesadilla is made by taking this, this tortilla that's already been cooked in some oil, right? And then you put a whole bunch of cheese and some meat, and then you put some veggies in there just to make yourself feel better. And then some more cheese. You flip it over, and then you put it in a pan of butter. And let me tell you, that quesadilla is life. It gives you life. So when I transformed it, I said, how can I break down every single ingredient and make it much more nutritious for me? So I was using goat cheese. I was using lean chicken. I was using the same, um, you know, I was using different tortillas, wheat tortillas. And I cut the calories in half. So again, I don't think God will put us on this earth with all of the, these wonderful foods and cuisines and say we can't eat it. It's about portion control and it's about how we prepare the foods. Okay, um, Chef, I didn't quite understand the other question, so I'm, I'm just going to okay. let that slide for a minute. But okay. let me just um, get a few people in here. Hold on a second. Sure, sure. Uh, is that one? Did we? Um, is this one going to be played too? Are we gonna, hey, how you doing? We can play that one too, right? Are please. We um, Add some more the, the smoked beef can it be substituted with hot dog? With what? Hot dog. Hot dog. Yeah. Okay, uh, yes, yeah. I mean, technically, yes, you can. I don't think hot dog would be a good substitute because it's, I'm, and again, I'm speaking from American perspective, I'm not sure how they're made here, but usually hot dogs are just like processed meat and processed, it's very high in sodium, so you know, flavor to it, so if that's what you can get, then go ahead and do that. Um, but I would not suggest putting a hot dog in there because you, you lose like a lot of the flavor. Again, the, the, the sausage has, carries so much flavor. It also carries a lot of the oil, so that way we don't have to add more oil to the skillet. Okay, okay Chef, um, I have an que interesting question here. So someone is questioning the fact that you are a Harvard student and you're a chef. Oh. So <laughs> let, me, let me have him ask, him this ask you this question. Hold on a second. Okay. All right. Hi, Chef. Hi. My name is Benjamin. And um, I'm kind of facing uh, a challenge, per se, and um, I found this as an opportunity to ask you. As an Harvard graduate, many people will look at you that you should be sitting at a corner in an office, putting on a suit, but you have decided to be in the kitchen. How have you been able to cope um, with uh, different situations from the fact that you want to follow your passion? So, uh, on the last part of the question was what have I been able to do? What with my passion? To cope. To cope with that? And to prove people wrong. Oh, to pro oh okay. <laughs> so pretty much, right. pretty much. To, to prove people wrong. You, you know, a lot of, I, I don't, to be completely honest, I, you can ask my assistant right here in the front row, I never talk about Harvard. I, I never even brought it up. People see that on the thing and, and they do that themselves. But let me tell you a little bit, not about what Harvard's done for me, but what God's done for me. So. When I quit my job, first off, I started out in, into consulting. I gained a whole bunch of weight because I was traveling around the world um, and doing, doing projects. And I really just felt disconnected to the value that I was creating. And as I gained my weight, I was really just trying to lose some weight. So on the side, I started up this whole passion project of Fit Men Cook, and it was not to go and change the world. It was not to do that. It was to change my diet and to do it for free. Because when I was sharing my recipes online, it was like a side hustle, right? So I was thinking, instead of paying somebody, let me share every single meal that I'm eating so I can get free advice. That's a good hustle, right? And it worked. But the reverse happened. I found out there were so many people just like me and just like y'all who are really passionate about changing their own diets. So people began to follow me in droves. And I, and, and, 
And it's funny because my company goes to this big conference every single year in Austin. I was invited to that conference as an employee, and they had no idea. And they, you know, and they had no idea about it. Take that out, please. That's, that's way overdone. Um, and so it was in at that moment, and I was thinking, like, maybe there's something to this. And people began to follow me in droves. Um, and then I'll just tell you, um, I, I quit my job uh, here, as, here you as a black man in Lagos, Nigeria. You're looking at the other the top health male foodie in the world. I've got the number one app in over 80 different countries. Um, the people, the executives in the side corner office, they're actually the ones calling me up to do projects. So I don't, so I, I don't really, I don't really have to go and prove anything wrong right, because right. there's nothing, there's nothing to do there. <laughs> um, chef, I think I'm just gonna have to close it there because yeah. we really don't have time. But there's one so, question, right? Yeah. So, so this lady was asking, can this jambalaya sauce be made? abstract from, with the, from the stack Absolutely, itself. it can. Because I think that hopefully, I, I, I put this recipe too, so that you all can see the similarities in African American cuisine and also like Nigerian cuisine with the jollof rice. So you can actually make this separately if you wanted to. Okay. So I want to thank you all again for having me out. It's been a complete honor, literally. Um, it's been a complete honor just to be here. I had to be here at this event. Again, thank you to GT Bank for giving me this opportunity and giving me this platform. And a big shout out to Chef Tian. Your students have been amazing. Can y'all help me thank, please, Chef James and also Laura in the kitchen. All right, y'all. OK, my last thing here, I, and I told them, too, that I like to talk a whole lot. But I end every video with boom. So I want y'all to help me out to say boom, OK? All right, so I'm going to say one, two, three, boom, all right? One, two, three, boom!